So today I wanted to talk about uh, racism and uh, police brutality. If you're wondering why a Buddhist nun is talking about this, for me, uh, it is an ethical issue, yeah, how we treat other human beings. It also relates to our practice of love and compassion that as Mahayana uh, practitioners we're trying to cultivate. So, uh, you know, these kinds of um, Buddhist principles apply to all areas of our life. And here I want to speak and show how they apply to uh, racism and police brutality. Also, in, in talking about this, off, I'll sometimes make big generalizations, the people of color, the African American community. I'm not talking about everybody in those groups, okay? I'm just mentioning general, large groups, but certainly there's many, many people who are not fitting, who are African Americans or people of color who are not uh, fitting into the ca specific categories that I'm talking about, you know, living in a community uh, that is impoverished and so on. So, um, what I wanted to talk about a little bit is the history of uh, police brutality in relationship to uh, the African American community and about racism against African Americans in general. Okay? So we all know it started, at least in America, with slavery. Yeah? So then after 19, uh, 1865, the 13th Amendment was passed, and that gave African Americans uh, citizenship and the right to vote. Okay, so that was a, and it abolished, it abolished slavery. So it was really, you know, that was the one that particularly abolished slavery. So, you know, everybody thought, okay, now it's done with. Well, not exactly. During slavery, the police were involved in catching uh, runaway slaves. Okay, it wasn't, they weren't necessarily the police, they were often vigilantes, they're, you know, various different people who were uh, in charge of catching runaway slaves. After 1865, they thought, okay, that's done. But um, what happened instead is because the 13th Amendment, you know, which abolished slavery, said uh, nobody should be a slave, enslaved unless uh, they had committed a criminal offense. So then what happened in the South was um, they started arresting all the African Americans uh, for doing hardly anything, okay? And so that's when they started all these prison gangs. And you can see some old photos of them wearing stripes and working in the sugar fields and the cotton fields and so on. Okay, so it, it, it was the same kind of thing, but it just changed form after, uh, after emancipation. Then, uh, so that went on for uh, a little bit, and then they instituted the, you know, Jim Crow laws. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, it, it's a set of laws that developed over time in the South, which um, established segregation. So that's when you had uh, restaurants for where the whites sit and areas where the blacks sit, and the blacks have to sit in the black back of the bus, and uh, you know, difficulty getting jobs and all of that very overt discrimination. You know? And so that went on for a while. And then, you know, the African Americans, you have Rosa Parks, who refused to sit, give up her seat, and different people, you know, uh, some young African American men who went into a, um, a so, um, what is it, a soda fountain and sat in the areas where the whites were supposed to sit and refused to move. 
and you had the Freedom Riders, you had you know some young uh, white Americans from the North come down, and then the blacks also to uh, get people to register to vote, and you had the Civil Rights era in the uh, 1960s, and so that uh, kind of got rid of the Jim Crow, supposedly, okay? But what happened after that, um, and you see that how the police were involved in the Jim Crow because you had all these ridiculous segregationist rules involving education, work, army, everything, you know, and so the police had to enforce that. Yeah. Then when the Civil Rights Act in the, in the mid-60s, I think it was in 65, uh, did away with that, then, uh, well, actually, before that, before they, they did away with that, after uh, World War II, because you had uh, African-American uh, units in the, in the military and white units. The military was not integrated, yeah. But afterwards, when they came back, uh, then there was this thing called redlining, where uh, for the, the white soldiers, you know, they got married, they wanted to buy a house and have kids. And so th there was this whole program set up where they could get loans and then buy a house. And there were these little communities established called Levitt Towns, where you know, they bought houses, and they lived there, and they got loans. And the whole thing about getting loans to, to buy a house is that then your money is going into some real property. And when you get old, you know, if you sell the house, or if you can give the money to your kids, or you could give the house to your kids. So there's the opportunity for intergenerational wealth to be passed down. But with redlining, yeah, what they did is they didn't say this was against uh, the African Americans. They just outlined certain areas of different cities and said that the people in these areas could not get loans to buy houses. Yeah, and so then you had people uh, trying to live there or getting some kind of loan somewhere else and then it being called in and they didn't have the money uh, to pay off and so they would lose their house. We saw some videos about this, remember? Okay, so that stopped the African American community from collecting intergenerational wealth that could be passed down to the kids. And that kind of wealth is very important because that's what enables your kids to go to college and your kids to have a head start in life. Whereas if you're always renting, which they were forced to do because uh, they couldn't get the loans, um, then there's, you don't get any equity in a house. You have nothing to sell afterwards and all your money is going. So there's no intergenerational wealth. Okay, so then you had uh, 65, yeah, and the Civil Rights Act. Uh, so that supposedly did away with segregation and everything like that. But then what they did is, uh, and this, it was foretold by the redlining, they developed, the government developed policies uh, which on the surface didn't mention African Americans or any minorities but actually applied to those people because those people were the ones who would be influenced by these policies, okay? So you have um, the war on drugs, yeah? So the, the war on drugs, you had crack cocaine in the, um, in the African American areas and powdered cocaine in the white areas. The police um, patrolled the black areas. The government made the penalties for crack cocaine 
um, much more severe than for powdered cocaine. So what happened is not many white people were arrested for dealing in cocaine. Many black family, uh, black men in particular, were arrested and imprisoned. And this really ripped apart black families because now all of a sudden so many people are being imprisoned. So this is really the beginning of the mass incarceration area, era. And what we have, um, we call it the, the school to prison pipeline. Yeah, so kids uh, are raised in poor areas, They're give, their uh, schools are inferior, the teachers have huge classrooms, they don't have modern textbooks, so the kids get a, a very poor education. Yeah, so what do you do when you have a poor education and you can't get a job also because there's prejudice? because they just look at your name, and there are some names that, uh, you know, kind of stand out as white names, and other names that stand out as African American names. So even without meeting you, you're not given the job, okay? So this is the kind of prejudice that it African American isn't written into the law, but you can see the bills are made for these people and the punishments are made for these people as a way of keeping them down, okay? Um, one thing I did forget to mention, uh, going back to the beginning of the 20th century, was all this science that supposedly proved that blacks were inferior, you know? So people doing uh, eugen eugenics, yeah and then coming up with these conclusions that due to different gene kind of things that it was an inferior race. Of course, that was later disproved because people basically, all human beings basically have the same genes and there's very small differences, okay? But that was really the trend in society to, uh, and, and people were told that and it was science, so they believed it. Okay, so that was the beginning of the 20th century. So let's come back to the middle of the, the 20th century. So we had the war on drugs, which particularly hurt the African American community. And then we had, starting with Nixon, this whole thing about law and order. So that was related to the war on drugs, but really cutting, you know, because when you have drug problems, what do you do? You break into people's house. And to get the money for your drugs, and so then they started the war on drugs, um, not the the um, uh, the law and order campaign. Okay, so starting with Nixon, going into the first George Bush, you know everybody's pushing the war on drugs. We're law and order, and we've you know there are so many criminals on the street. And so we've got to get them off the street. And of course, most who were most of these people, the African Americans who couldn't get jobs, who were uh, doing crack cocaine. So, so mass incarceration, putting them in prison. Okay. Then you you come to uh, Bill Clinton, and at that time, uh, you know, he was running against the sec. Who was he running against? The second. No, he was running against the first George Bush, wasn't he? And, um, and so that George Bush was law and order. And so people were being really afraid in the country. So they all wanted law and order. So uh, Clinton said, OK, I'm jumping on the bandwagon advocating for law and order. That's how he won the election. And then what did they do? They passed the crime bill in 1994. That was the three strikes and you're out bill. So who does that bill harm the most? The African American community. Yeah, the, the immigrants. Um, you know, because even for, th for th nonviolent crimes, if you get three convictions, you're in prison for the rest of your life for nonviolent crimes, okay? 
So uh, Clinton did that. Then there was the whole welfare reform because there were talks of, you remember the welfare queen? You know, the African-American woman with tons of kids who drove a Cadillac and collected welfare. Yeah, and so people were very upset because all their tax money is going to all these people who lie, who actually have Cadillacs and are rich, but collect uh, welfare. Of course, that's not true, yeah, but that was what people were told and what they believed. And so as, uh, you know, part of what Clinton did, um, you know, was cut off welfare to a lot of people, okay? And so here's, um, and then the people who were imprisoned, when they did get out, they couldn't get jobs because on the application forms for jobs, there's a section, have you ever been convicted of a crime and imprisoned? And they had to say yes. And then, of course, they wouldn't get hired. Okay, so all this is going on. Then, okay, so the police are involved in all this kind of stuff. You know, if you collect welfare improperly or they think you're doing that, or, you know, to arrest all these people on taking drugs, the people stealing money to support their drug habit. So, and, and so you get the police very much involved. And then the police always um, patrol the African-American neighborhoods much more than they patrol the white neighborhoods, yeah? And... Uh, you know, there are the kids with the inferior schools and there's no uh, after-school activities for the kids, so the kids get in trouble and the kids hang out in the parks and then, you know, there's crime and all this kind of stuff, okay? So all of that's going on. And there, here's where you're also really starting to get the pr police brutality in the way they patrol the neighborhoods. Then, in also in terms of the, ju the justice, or what I call the injustice system, um, bail laws, you know, setting bail uh, so that even if people are arrested for a small crime, the bail is more than they can pay. And so then, uh, they, if they had a job, but let's say they, you know, uh, yeah, they did something, you know, shoplifted or, you know, something like that. Uh, okay, they wouldn't be able to get a, uh, a job, but the, the bail was set so high that they couldn't pay, and then they would be imprisoned. And we really learned about this a few years ago uh, in terms of Ferguson, Missouri, uh, because it came out that so many of the uh, people in Ferguson were in prison because they couldn't pay their parking tickets. Yeah? So you have a choice between putting food on the table for your family or paying your parking ticket. What are you going to do? Then you can't pay your parking ticket. You can't pay your traffic ticket. Then they put you in prison. So if you had a job, you lose your job then your family gets more in debt. The family is broken apart because, you know, fa some family members are imprisoned and others aren't, and then they're trying to get money, and, you know, it's, it, they don't do it. So then co coming up to, um, yeah, so the police are involved in that, arresting those people, to putting them in prison again. So then we come up to modern day, and um, we get these um, for-profit prisons, okay? So prisons used to be run by the government. Then the government thought, oh, we can farm it out to, uh, to private enterprises. So you get something like the correction, what is it, CCA, Correction Centers of America, something like that. I've been to a couple of their prisons. But they're for-profit prisons, and they pay dividends to the, um, to the shareholders. 
So to keep those prisons up, you have to arrest more people and convict them and put them in prison so that the shareholders get money. So who do they arrest more? What neighborhoods do they patrol more? The African-American neighborhoods, okay? And what comes out of this is there's this thing called ALEC, it's something like American Legislative Enterprise Committee, something like that. What it is, is it's a group of corporate leaders and uh, lawmakers, federal lawmakers, most of whom are Republicans, and they chat together and decide what kind of laws they want to bring up in Congress. So, because there's all these corporate leaders, so many of the laws that they make favor the corporate leaders, okay? Many people didn't know about this organization. I remember hearing about it a few years ago, you know, ALEC, A-L-E-C, yeah? And so they would uh, decide laws, give them to the, to the senators or congresspeople who would propose them as their own bills, uh, either in state legislatures or federal legislature. And then this was another way of um, fueling people making money off of incarcerating people. Okay, making money off of uh, disadvantaging people. For example, and the guys I write to in, in prison and the prisons I've visited, this is for sure. You know, for us to make a, uh, a phone call in the States, it's pennies, isn't it? You know, to do it from your, your house, the, your line in your house, or even your cell phone, it costs very little to make a phone call in the States. In the prisons, they make special deals with the phone company where maybe it's a dollar and 50 cents for one minute of a phone call. These are the people who are the most impoverished. Having regular contact with their family and friends outside is a proven factor for low recidivism. But by making the phone calls so expensive, yeah, first of all, the phone companies are raking in a lot of money. Second of all, they're breaking the family connections, which means that probably more of those people are gonna get rearrested and a higher recidivism rate afterwards. So it will function to keep the private prisons full and have more clients for the phone calls. Okay, um, so th this is, you know, really going on, and what can, and what you see is this pattern of uh, the police and government oppressing the African American communities. The people speaking up, some of those uh, oppressive laws and regulations being abolished but then new ones being enacted. And they're getting more and more clever because the new ones being enacted don't always overtly seem to adversely affect the, the people of color, but they do. Okay, so nowadays, uh, you know, all the ger gerrymandering that's going on, to, uh, in congressional districts to prevent people, uh, minority people from uh, voting. Or no, they can vote, but all their votes are collected in, in one area, and so it affects how the representatives and how the electoral college and so on, how their votes go, okay? So that's being done by, you know, our lawmakers, mostly Republicans. Um, the thing of states requiring uh, a state ID in order to vote, and it's very difficult for people who are poor, who live especially in rural areas, or even in the city, to get to a DMV, 
And when you go to a DMV, you have to wait hours and hours. So if you have a job and you're getting paid hourly, you don't get paid for that. When you vote, you have to take time off of work and people are waiting sometimes, you know, six, eight hours in line to, to, to vote. Now they don't, they're trying to um, get it so that people can't request mail-in ballots, you know, which will adversely affect people, yeah. So there's all these very sneaky things that uh, people in power are doing to suppress the, the communities of color, yeah. And it, they just outlaw, you know, one of them is overcome and then another one is thought up. Yeah. So this is kind of the situation of the, the, the communities of color. And it's, it's very difficult. And I'm hoping, you know, with what's happening now and the fact that the, the protests are going on, and things, we're starting to see some things move immediately, which is very good. Now the thing is, after the protests stop, will things continue to move? Or will they, again, make certain laws that to protect the communities of color, but then not enforce those laws? Because that's another thing that they've done, okay? So it's, it's a, a tricky situation, but it's a whole complicated ongoing thing. And the police and the injustice system are involved throughout, and so are the, the state and federal, federal, federal legislators. Yeah. Thank you, Vanilla. That's kind of very thorough. Um, appreciate that. One of the things that, um, you didn't mention that I think is worth looking at is how um, uh, minorities have been portrayed in movies and um, TV shows and the like. Yes. Where, where you know, usually the heroes are the cops or the policemen, mm -hmm. and who they're chasing after is mostly African Americans, Latinos, and other minorities in this country who are portrayed as criminals. Um, you know, skirting the law, doing something that is against, you know, the, the society, and that goes deep into people's psyches. Yeah. It's it, 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 because because you are watching some entertainment. There is no filter, and so your mind is just ripe for mm -hmm. assimilating unknowingly all those stereotypes and then of course they get acted out when you are in your regular home you have no and you have no idea how those ideas got there and they're there because of what you're consuming yeah. in terms of entertainment and so forth so there is um, a need as well to hold that to hold those uh, um, uh, medi mediums accountable for yes. the message that they're presenting and what they're feeding people. Right, exactly. I remember when I was little, you never saw people on color on TV, you know, unless it was on a news report and people getting arrested. Aside of that, I mean, what we grew up with, Leave it to Beaver, Lassie, Harry and Harriet, and no, Ozzy and Harriet, um, Leave it to, did I say Leave it to Lucy? Uh, you know, uh, well, I love Lucy, yeah. So, you know, all these kinds of things. We never saw minorities. So then people spoke out about that. Now you see minorities, but like you said, they're the bad guys that the cops are chasing after and arresting, you know. And how all these things of entertainment really go into th people's minds and uh, evoke prejudices that, you know, they don't even know where they came from. Yeah. Um, this is one reason I was so touched by the New Yorker article by uh, Brian Stevenson is that he really highlighted how unreasonable it is that the uh, communities of color have been um, identified as dangerous and guilty. Yes. And in the, some of the videos that we saw early on, we saw how there was actually a propaganda movement of 
pictures and cartoons portraying mm -hmm. uh, people of color in in dangerous scenarios and yeah. uh, in an unfavorable light. So I agree that this has gone deeply into the yeah. psyche of people and it's yeah. unreasonable. In the, in the late 19th century, you know, with the whole thing of blackface and the cartoons there uh, in, in, in the newspapers portrayed African Americans as lazy, as ignorant, and so forth. And then the whole thing of portraying them, uh, criminal, portraying them as criminals and guilty, that came uh, more in the 20th century, yeah, with that. And yeah, it just, uh, what happens is not only the general public starts uh, seeing the communities of color like that, but those the communities of color start seeing themselves like that, and what I especially with the young people, yeah, um, the young people sometimes in, in these communities, the only vision they have of their future is for us, uh, the young men is getting arrested and going to prison because. Uh, they estimate that one third of all African American men will spend time in prison at some time during their life. That's amazing, isn't it? One third. White people, one, uh, one in seven. And one, I'm sorry, one in 17. Black people, one in three. Yeah? So you get these, these stereotypical Im images. And so much harm comes when the kids imbibe them themselves and they don't see any future for themselves. Yeah? The girls, the future they see is getting pregnant. So they get pregnant when 15, 16, 17. The boys, you know, you look for role models, what's happening, you know? You steal a car or something, you go to prison. And these are the kind of generational things that are passed down that are so damaging, you know, um, especially to the young kids and, you know, who, who say, yeah, that's, that's all I can do in life. That's all I can be in life. So it takes, you know, we know from our own experience in trying to overcome our own negative self-images and negative self-talk, how difficult that is. Imagine if your whole community is like that, you know, and that's the role model you see in your entire community. Yeah, very difficult. Yeah. What really stood out was the, your mention of intergenerational wealth and how that hasn't been able to yeah. accumulate and. I think that is so true, and it made me think. I thought that you know I just did well, I studied well, and these opportunities were there because I'm a good person. But no, it's all of my ancestors' efforts that really yeah. brought me to the world that I experienced. And it goes against this myth of the individual, you know, that we each have equal opportunities when yep. we start out. Yep. It's like our lives are so dependent on our parents and who has come mm -hmm. before us. And so we get especially this thing of pick yourself up by your own bootstraps. So the, the white Americans think they've done that. Actually, they have the intergenerational wealth. But they then look to, at the people of color and the immigrants and say, oh, well, we picked ourselves up by our own bootstraps. You should do. Yeah, but people come to this country with nothing, you know? And of course, you know, people who were enslaved afterwards, they have nothing. They were supposed to get, I think, 40 acres or 20 acres and a mule, but not all of them did. Instead, many of them were thrown in prison. So. I appreciate the history, and I want to just say, because I, I think this is not a, it's not a, it's not a part of what you, you believe, but it's part of what I heard is to not generalize so exclusively that not all communities, I mean, there are tremendous role models in the African-American community. Yeah. There's been a tremendous work in people achieving education and mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, doing great things and creating things, and that's oh, yeah. and that's created some of the um, some of the possibility for the outcry that may be changing now. Yeah. So I just wanted. Oh, I, yeah. I just wanted to say that. I was making a yes, very I know. Yeah, I wild know. You were, you were general, generalizing General, wisely. Yeah, widely. for the for the purpose of yeah. making a point. Of yeah. course, that doesn't include everybody. Yeah, yeah. So I just know. wanted to I say mean, that explicitly. To me, it's like so obvious it doesn't include everybody that I didn't even think to mention it. But thank you. <laughs> In case people misunderstand me.